Defense Intelligence Agency and on active duty in the U.S. Navy. After his military service, Mr. Mazafro worked for the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, EMC, Oracle, and CSRA, mostly on intelligence projects. He has his degrees from the Naval Postgraduate School at St. Joseph's University. Awful nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Thanks, Thanks a lot for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. So as Max said, uh, you know, it's actually next year will be 50 years in the intelligence community or close thereby running with a bag and security clearances. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is uh, the IC as a centerpiece, hard, heavy user of IT, potential model or learning place for IT modernization for the federal government. Um, the intelligence community has been in the information business since it started. That's what it does. It collects it, it slices, it dices it, it changes its, its, its forms in some cases, adds value to it, and delivers it to users. Sounds like what most people are trying to do across the, across the government with information. Uh, I'm going to get back to that point in a little bit. Uh, most of you, if you're not aware of just budget sense of the IC and how much it spends, $70 billion, okay? $70 billion annual budget. Uh, the IT part, you know, you get down, that gets classified. What's the budget of DHS? $45 billion, okay? This would be the third largest agency, if it were a single agency, in the government. And it's information dependent. Um, now, the IC doesn't like to think of itself this way, but you know, one of the best practices in, in industry, you all know, is benchmark. So what would, the IC hates it. What would you look at to measure what we do? Well, nothing, that's what they'll tell you. There's nothing like what we do. No, that's wrong. It's just absolutely wrong. They don't want to hear it, but it's wrong. They're in the content providing business. And they can learn a lot from the private sector in terms of information from places like Bloomberg, News Corp, Time Warner, my favorite Disney, interestingly enough, but I love Disney, because they've got bases, you know, those theme parks. They have force protection issues. There are customers at those theme parks. They've got a lot of things that are similar to what the government does, and they're very information intensive. Oh yeah, you know what else they have? They've got a security problem. And I don't mean security of protection. You know, the, the intel community will tell you, well, we've got special security problems. We've got you know, super secret satellite pictures, so forth and so on. Anybody ever think about the pixels of Snow White and how valuable and important they are in terms of intellectual capital and how secure Disney keeps them? Try and get them. You got a better chance, actually, of getting those pixels out of NRO than you do out of Disney. Um, so the IC has been dealing with, uh, with, with big data since the beginning of the reconnaissance satellite age in the early 60s. Uh, and uh, to deal with that, it's created a variety of programs. I think most of these will be unknown to you because they're, you know, they're boutique, arcane sort of situations. But in the 1970s, when I first was uh, a young intelligence officer, I was working on a, ne on a networked computer, local well, computer network, okay? In 1970, what are many places else in the government where that was happening? And in the 1980s, DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, created a thing called the Modern Integrated Database. Okay, that's the first enterprise database, certainly in DOD. Uh, I won't say it's the first in the commercial world, but it was you know, one of the early ones in government. It's still running today. Badly, but it's still running today. Uh, then in the 1990s, it created JWEX. Revolutionary revolutionary, moving bulk data globally. Bulk data, we're talking about, at the time, gigabytes to terabytes, okay? That kind of that kind of size. But to be able to do that globally. The way you used to do it was you put it in an envelope and you carried it or you mailed it before that. Then the IT revolution happened. The dot boom happened. And things didn't go so well for the Intel community. They haven't gone well since then. Okay, those were all successful. Uh, but, uh, some, you know, the dynamic change, as you all know, uh, uh, 
IT technology, ARPANET, the internet, they all came out of the government. Okay? But circa 1992, 1993, pick your time, Google comes out, Netscape, you know, those are, those are big changes. And the, and the government didn't really understand them, anticipate them, or prepare for them, and the intelligence community certainly didn't either. And guess what happens? Now that IT starts to sputter and fail, you get programs like Trailblazer, Future Imagery Architecture, IC Map, and they just die, and they waste years and money at uh, you know at you know frankly at uh, non McCurdy levels of, uh, uh, of, of of wasted failure. Uh, so, you know, this goes on for a while, and then along comes uh, Jim Clapper as the DNI circa, I guess it was 2012, right, Greg? 11. 11. And he says, you know, we got to get this, we got to, we got, we got to stop the bleeding, and we got to do something right now. He decides that he's going to create an IC IT enterprise, which actually spells out to eyesight, and he starts about to build it. He does this as this top-down, driven, you know, what we hear about, hey, we got a good idea, there's nothing wrong with the technology, we're not going to use any, any unusual technology, we're going to use commercially proven technology, we're going to drive it top-down, and guess what? It doesn't exactly work that way. Not everybody picks it up, not everybody thinks it's a good idea, not everybody wants to spend the money on it this way, or spend it on it that way. Oh, you know, you have to have data standardization. Well, we like our standard of data, so let's compromise and do it my way, not your way, okay? And so the things that would make this enterprise work became, a, uh, frankly, a governance, uh, a, a governance problem. But there are some things to really learn here, uh, particularly about the cloud and cloud adoption. And I think, you know, as, as as particularly right now defense looks at Jedi, uh, there's some things to really learn from the C2S, GovCloud instantiation, uh, with the IC went through, and they're not pretty, okay? This idea, well, we just, you know, hey, go out and get me a cloud, and life will be good. Data will be available, it'll be secure, nothing to, you know, nothing to worry about. Well, let me start with the first problem that you're gonna have when you instantiate some sort of massively scaled cloud. You're going to run two systems. You're going to run your legacy system, and you're going to run that new one. And if you don't have the money, you're going to have to make some tough choices. And when you're a combat support agency, like many of the intelligence agencies are, you don't get a choice. You have to run the one that works, not the one you want to run. It's just that simple. It's the law. And people will walk and say, yes, I'd love to move to the cloud tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. But I've got, I've, I've got to answer this combatant commander's needs today. And I know this works, and I'm not sure that that does. What do I do? They're going to default to the what works every time. More importantly, though, they're not going to have the budget to run both. And that's been proven to be the case with, I, with EyeSight and AWS. So account for that. The other thing is, hey, we're going to migrate data. Now, that sounds easy enough. Well, when it's at scale and it's in bulk, no, it's not. It takes a long time. You get the formatting problems. You've got a whole bunch of issues. So migrating data is one of these things that's easy to say and really, really hard to do. And if you don't think it's hard to do, okay, I'll give you that. It's going to take you a long time to do. It does not happen instantaneously. Okay? Um, scale. Cloud scale. Well, you know, when many commercial users, you've got access to the Internet, you've got access to what I would describe as, you know, the, the, the G4 networks and all of those sort of things. But what if you don't? What if you don't? Oh, okay, we'll, you know, we'll do the snow pile approach. We'll pile all that stuff up, put it in a container, and ship it to you. Well, what if you're in a ship at sea? What if you're in Shimia, Alaska? Now what do you do? Okay, so scale is an issue here. Not that, not that you don't do it because you've got a scale problem, but you've got to account for it. There are places in this enterprise in DOD and the IC where what you consider natural and normal just don't reach. And you can't, you've, got, you've got to account for how you're going to get the information there and how you're going to get information from there, you know, back, uh, back into the cloud. Uh, the other thing, and no one I don't think has mentioned this today, every time I look at an enterprise data information issue, frankly anywhere, 
but certainly in the intelligence community, it turns out to be an ETL problem, okay? Extraction, transfer, and load. I got data that I've got to get out of something, I got to transfer it to somewhere, and I got to load it somewhere, okay? You know, and the, uh, the, 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 the smart IT guys will tell you, that's not a clip phrase. That there's a, there is engineering and architecting that has to go with that that's specific to your situation. So you just don't, you just can't put, you know, the, the lightning bolts in a cloud around that, oh, ETL, an ETL happens here. Well, no, it won't happen naturally unless you design an account, unless you account for it. And usually what I have seen, you know, what I would describe as high-level architectures that are generally pretty good fail. It's at that ETL level of, at that ATL level of the camp. Then you've heard a lot about security. And uh, I won't dispute that the cloud has got a lot to a lot to offer in terms of security, but it's you know it's uh, it also is it also has got some risks, okay? And the big problem in the I, in the IC with security is identity management. Who are you? What permissions do you have? And what data are you allowed to see? Under what circumstances? Now we can talk about whether those are realistic requirements or not, but they're the requirements today, and they have been historic, and they and they're not going away tomorrow. So you do have to account for a fairly significant identity uh, protocols, uh, architectural specialities, and so forth and so on. No, no, no. Okay, what the ones and zeros mean are different, but the ones and zeros are the same. And there are a lot of, actually, as you've heard today, some several very, very good off-the-shelf security systems that work at places like Disney, pick your favorite bank, uh, uh, telephone company, you know, those, those sort of things. And the IC just can't see its way to figure out how to use them. Uh, it's got to have its own because its ones and zeros are different. We talked a lot about artificial intelligence today. Um, I'm a real fan, but um, the but is this. Uh, artificial intelligence is not simple, it's complicated. Anybody who's doing anything around it will tell you that. How complicated is it? Well, you haven't heard anybody here today, and you won't because it doesn't exist. Give me a, a, a theoretical predictive model of, it, of artificial intelligence. Predictive. You know, if you put the if you put if you put the, the algorithms together like this, the data like that, you will get the following results. I like boils more. You, you heat up the gas, it expands. And you know how fast it's going to expand and so forth. You don't know that in artificial intelligence today. And nobody knows it because it's a new, new technology and new form. So you have to build trust in it, particularly where you're dealing with lethal force. Um, it's very, very task-specific and context-dependent. It doesn't work. Just stop, just turn on the, the AI algorithm and, and everything starts working. No, it doesn't. You have to tune it. As you've heard, you know, you've got to run through training algorithms. You've got a whole bunch of things to do to make it functional. And third, most importantly of all, if you could deliver an AI solution to any intel agency that I know today, they don't have a workforce that knows how to use it. They do not have a workforce that knows how to use it. So there's a workforce issue. Uh, my view, and this is my final, my final thought, the IC has been in the business since the dot-com uh, uh, boom, change, revolution of chasing IT. Okay, you see something new and shiny out in, in industry, doing great things. So, you know, it used to be you know, it was cloud, it was big data, it's been analytics, now it's AI, okay? And it's chasing it to build it, to get some one of our companies to build it for them or integrate it and deliver it. That's, they're not going to get there. They're, they're, they're too far behind and they will always be behind. And then they don't have the workforce to, to, as I said, to use it. The better model, in my view, for particularly the Intel community, and maybe other parts of the government, is IT as a service. AWS is model, so we know it works. Uh, but where you do, you know, you have cloud as a service, you have Greenway up at NSA, which is infrastructure as a service, and I would submit to you the next new thing to be looking for, particularly in terms of information-dominant agencies like the Intel community, is data as a service. And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you, Joe. That was great.